Hi everybody, today we're moving on with our marine mammal lecture and we're going to talk about the cetaceans or cetacea which are the toothed whales and the baleen whales, 86 species in two different groups as I'll explain. The odontoceti which are the toothed whales but this also includes dolphins and porpoises uh, which are considered tooth whales. So sometimes they lump those together and sometimes they don't. It kind of depends on what you want to call a toothed whale, but they are related all to one another. And then the mysticeti, and these are the baleen whales. Those two groups separated probably around 34 million years ago, and there are 76 species of toothed whales, or there were more toothed whales than anything else. And the baleen whales, there are 16. Now, when you add those two together, you get 92 species, not 86. So I'm just going to stick with 92 species. Part of the reason for this is how they group species. So sometimes there's uh, what we call lumpers and there's what we call splitters. So there's some variation in there. So I'll just stick with 76, 16, and 92 uh, as we go. The closest living relatives of the whales uh, is the hippopotamus. Those two groups probably split 54 million years ago. The whales are all aquatic, raise their young, all that stuff at sea. And they range in size from eight feet, which is the smallest, the dwarf sperm whale, to 100 feet, which is the largest animal that has ever lived, larger even than all the dinosaurs we've ever found. They have modified nostrils in the form of blowholes on the top of their uh, body, and that, that allows them to breathe through the blowhole without needing to surface uh, their mouth out of the water and breathe surface air, but many of them can remain underwater for a very long time. The sperm whale, for example, uh, one of the deepest diving marine mammals, 90 minutes they can hold their breath for a very long time. Once again, not very large lungs. It's not the size of the lungs that matters in this deep diving. It is the very large spleen, the large amount of extra blood, and the extensive amount of myoglobin, the protein we mentioned before when we talk about seals and sea lions, that allows them to hold their breath for a very long period of time um, and, and stay submerged for a long period of time. They are endothermic like all the other mammals we've talked about and they have a layer of fat in the form of blubber which is true for most of the marine mammals but a couple we mentioned are not like that but the whales are that way. They're also thought to be highly intelligent which you probably already know. Uh, they have a very large brain. They have uh, what's called a complex neocortex which is what you find in animals like humans which is the outside portion of the brain where there's lots of folds and there's a lot of surface area there. And there's also these specialized cells that we have called spindle cells. Uh, these are primarily these unbranched neurons. Those are also associated with intelligent animals. Those are found in uh, the whales as well. They have no olfactory lobes and so therefore their sense of smell is thought to be non-existent or at least not very uh, sophisticated. Uh, there's a couple of exceptions to that, they think, uh, but their sense of smell is probably not a very strong, at the very least, their sense of smell is probably not their best sense. They have what's called a tapetum lucidum in their eye, which allows light to be reflected back onto the retina, the light sensitive portion of the eye. Uh, which means they probably have pretty good vision in low light. However, they have very small eyes relative to their body size for the most part. So there's some debate about how well their vision really works. Um, probably in deeper water, it doesn't work all that well. But the sense that is by far the most interesting, I think, in whales, and I think most scientists would agree with this, is they have this incredibly highly modified hearing. Uh, rather than hearing through their eardrum like uh, we do, instead it pr passes, the sound passes actually into the jaw and throat and skull. The, the external ear does not really have a pressure difference in water like what you have in on, on land. 
which is how our ears work. So they have a very highly modified hearing, which I'll talk a little bit about. Whaling has been going on for a very long time, since 1875, and even there are records going back to maybe 3000 BC. Way back in 3000 BC or so, this is thought to be mainly when people would take advantage of whales that were stranded or coming in close to shore and they would hunt those whales. But in that period of time, it was quite sustainable. For, for a very long period of time, uh, humans, as we've mentioned before, have not been very good in the ocean. Uh, so our ability to access all the parts of the ocean has been much more recent. So in the 18th and 20th centuries, the whaling was the worst, and that's when whales were hunted nearly to extinction. Many of them populations down to 90 or down 90% or more, so almost to the brink of extinction. And in 1986, uh, and, and prior to that, other laws were put into place. But in 1986, the International Whaling Commission passed legislation that they would collectively ban commercial whaling, which was designed because the numbers were so low by 1986, which helped a great deal. Whale populations rebounded somewhat. However, there are still countries that engage in what they call scientific whaling for scientific purposes. Um, and there are indigenous whaling communities that historically whales have been important as a food substance for years. And those groups are still allowed under certain international laws to engage in indigenous whaling, which in and of itself is probably very, um, very, very reasonable. And it's probably very ecologically friendly because the primitive methods of hunting whales probably were not tremendously successful. However, the problem is there are certain countries, Iceland, Japan, Norway, that kind of want to get rid of the ban on whaling and many of these countries sort of take advantage of the scientific whaling or the indigenous whaling and they kind of will use their large um, political powers and their large amounts of money to kind of alter that and under the sort of umbrella of scientific whaling and indigenous whaling they are using technology really and large boats and these kind of things to kind of do what uh, I would say it's probably not the intended purpose of what the scientific whaling and indigenous whaling laws were allowed to do. There's an interesting movie that uh, won a, a, a bunch of awards recently called The Cove, where they demonstrate them hunting dolphins. I think this one's in Japan, actually, uh, but it happens in other places in the world as well. And so you can check that out. And then, then of course, we have aquariums. And you probably know recently, if you've seen the documentary Blackfish, that killer whales and other animals like that have been under fire lately for catching killer whales, mainly and bringing them into captivity and putting them in shows and that kind of thing. And the, and, and the documentary Blackfish kind of made places like SeaWorld look bad. But so one of the things that I just want to point out quickly here going way back, uh, having gone to these places for many years, um, mainly zoos. So, so I take uh, students on field trips primarily to different zoos, and we've done that for, you know, 25 years or so. And one thing I found interesting, the zoos have had a better ability, I would say, to mention how the animals that they have in captivity are part of a conservation effort because many of the animals in captivity that you can go see at, say, San Diego Zoo, Los Angeles Zoo, and so forth, in the wild, their populations are down or extinct even because of habitat loss. And so one of the things that zoos have been able to do is to change that narrative somewhat into the fact that they are now conservation groups protecting the animals, which I think is probably very true. However, what happened was they've had these animals and they've been able to turn that story a little bit different. And a place like SeaWorld hasn't been able to do that because it's really hard to argue that killer whales um, are going extinct in the wild because everybody knows that they're really not. And so a place like SeaWorld or a place, and there are many places all over the world that have killer whales on display. They haven't been able to change that narrative as well, in my opinion, because there isn't the habitat loss 
that you see in many of these zoos. Another example, in this one particular bird show that I've been to for 25 years, in the last four or five years, they've taken that exact same bird show, the same birds, the same trainers, the same animals, doing the exact same uh, behaviors at the bird show. But instead, that same show now has a different narrative. They talk about, instead of the, the, the tricks that they can train the animal to do, they've changed the storyline to make it more about the conservation efforts of that particular institution and those animals, which is probably true, but it's, it's not how the story originally was told because I've been there watching it you know, for 25 years. And I started seeing them change this story, but again, same animals, same behaviors that they're doing, but they're able to change the narrative. So the other problem is it kind of depends on your animal. You know, this is one of the things we teach in my animal behavior course that we teach as well, is that there's a, a public perception. So a bunch of fish in an aquarium, the public kind of, I think, uh, appreciate the fish. They don't feel fish is uh, on display and is, is sort of trapped. We don't develop that sense and feel bad for the fish. Uh, but for say chimpanzees and for gorillas, when you go to the zoo, there's that sense that they are more like us and people uh, relate to that and they feel worse for those animals than they do say other animals. So even though they are all say, maybe uh, bred in captivity or captured from the wild, the public perception of what they see in that animal changes how they feel about it. And so much like uh, places like SeaWorld, dolphins, whales, and those things, there's a sense that those animals are more like us or more intelligent. And we have a, uh, we feel more of a, a sense way or we feel sad seeing those animals and we project our feelings uh, which may or may not be true but we project how we feel about certain animals differently than other animals and that changes sort of the narrative and how they can sell that story all right uh, I'm not going to mention too much here on whales because that's going to be part of PLC 5 in terms of talking about specific whales but uh, the, I'll, I'll just mention a couple here that I think are interesting and then uh, first sperm whale uh, is the it's the largest of the toothed predators of any sort. There's no predator alive right now that is larger than a sperm whale, 52 feet. It's the third deepest diving mammal that we know about. They can dive 7,382 feet. That's several thousand feet below the mile mark. And they have an incredible ability for using echolocation and vocalizations. The sounds they produce can be as loud as 230 decibels. Um, if you look at this scale here, you see that's way beyond hearing damage. It would rupture your eardrums. But these sounds are produced in water and water's a different medium. So the sperm whale gets its name because in the front of its head, it has this big cavity that has what's called spermaceti. It's a waxy material that was mistaken for the animal semen back you know, when they first started hunting them. And so that's how I got the name sperm whale, but it's actually a waxy substance. And it probably is used as a medium for sound waves to travel through. It's a really large space filled with this waxy material. And then it has this very large bone on the back that act kind of like a satellite dish to pick up sound that it can produce and bounce off objects. Kind of like what a bat does, but in this case, it's uh, underwater. All right, next we'll talk about baleen whales. Baleen is made out of keratin. That's the same thing that makes up your fingernails and your hair. It's a protein. We talked about that before. Uh, and it's used in filter feeding of plankton. And there are slightly different methods by which they do it. But the general idea is they open their mouth, they suck in a bunch of water, which includes plankton. And then as they close it, they modify the location of how they push the water out with their tongue. And these baleen plates capture the plankton to some degree, and then they swallowed that. So the baleen is used for filter feeding, and it's found in all the baleen whales. So whales also have an incredible amount of range in their hearing. They are able to hear and produce 
within the range of human hearing, which we have obviously, but also they can produce ultrasounds like in dolphins, which is kind of like what bats do, which is sort of higher than what humans can hear, higher frequencies. But then they can also produce very, very low frequencies uh, in what we call the infrasonic sound. And this is sounds that are below 30 hertz, which is also out of the range of human hearing. And many whales and elephants can also hear in that range uh, as well. And they use that in the water. And you might remember back one of the very first lectures we talked about um, in the history of marine biology, one of the things that was interesting in the 1940s when uh, World War II was happening and submarines got involved and the, the use of sonar got involved, the governments of the world had a particular interest in making sure they could find submarines using sonar and sound and picking up the sound. And up until that point, uh, humans didn't really know that there was any sounds being made in the ocean. And so once uh, we started developing sonar, uh, we started noticing that there's a whole bunch of animals in the water that are making sounds. We still have lots of trouble understanding what all the sounds mean and what they do. The baleen whale that I'll mention here is the blue whale, which is the largest animal that has ever existed, um, larger than even all the dinosaurs we found so far, 100 feet. Sometimes you see 97 feet, 98 feet. So I'm just gonna round it off and say 100 feet, 40,000 pounds, 40,000 pounds. And they produce infrasonic sounds in the eight to 25 hertz range. And again, this is a baleen whale, so it is a filter feeder. Um, and you can see once again, the range of human hearing here. All right, so I'm gonna stop there for that part on whales. That'll be the end of 2A. And I hope everyone's having a good day, having a good weekend, having a good evening, whatever time of day it is when you're watching this. And I will see you all soon.